Perfect. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Diego, for the invitation, and thank you, colleagues, for uh, for the time listening to this lecture. My name is Barham Abdeya. I'm the director of advanced endoscopy and professor of medicine, vice chair of innovation at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So today we're going to be talking about overview of the different intragastric balloons. Hopefully, I will give you a global picture about uh, the technology, where it fits in clinical practice and its therapeutic applications in the next 15 minutes. These are my disclosures. So before we uh, start talking about the technology itself, it's very important to highlight why do we need technologies like the intragastric balloon, where it maintains the anatomy or preserves the anatomy while offers significant weight loss uh, uh, advantage to the patient. Uh, the reason is most of obesity, as you know, is going unchecked, and there is a significant barrier for people to go to bariatric surgery. That's why it's only 1% of patients who are eligible end up getting bariatric interventions. And therefore, just like the field of cardiovascular medicine, where we have anatomy preserving minimally invasive tools that could do the job, we are developing the field together of endoscopic bariatric and metabolic therapies and space occupying devices like intragastric balloon that preserves the anatomy while offers a, a weight loss uh, or effective weight loss uh, is, is a player in that field to, to augment the spectrum of care. Now, technical details about the different balloons and a, a look at their mechanism of action. These are the balloons that are uh, available uh, uh, worldwide. The first four of these are available in the US market. The final one still does not have uh, FD approval, which is the ellipse. But as you can see, they come in different flavors. Uh, the, they're either fluid filled or gas filled balloons. The fluid filled are the Orbera, which is a single uh, fluid filled balloon that is spherical in shape and usually is filled with anywhere between 500 to 700 mLs of saline, could be mixed with methylene blue. The reshape du duo is a two balloon system uh, that uh, is uh, available uh, in the US as far as FDA approval, but it's not being marketed currently uh, because the, the uh, uh, the technology is, is being shelved. Then there's the Obalon uh, balloon, which is a series of three balloons filled with gas. They're swallowed at, uh, at a, over a 12 weeks interval, and they still stayed in, in, stay in place for six months from the last balloon insertion. And they all three balloons are removed endoscopically after a period of time. There's also the adjustable balloon, which is the SPATS 3 intragastric balloon uh, that was recently FDA approved uh, that allows the, uh, the operator to start with a smaller balloon volume and then build the volume uh, in order to uh, improve tolerance uh, for the balloon or increase efficacy once you hit, hit a weight loss plateau. And finally, the ellipse balloon, which is available in the global market, but not in the US yet, which is a, it's an endoscopy free balloon that is also fluid filled, spherical balloon in shape and residual time or stays in the stomach for about four months before the valve opens up and the balloon is self excreted uh, from the patient. Now the balloons, are, are, they have a lot of appeal because we talked about them preserving the anatomy, but also they're very technically easy to perform for your average uh, gastroenterologist, endoscopist or hepatologist. And I emphasize hepatologist because I think the balloons will play an important role in the management of NAFLD, which I will show you some data around that concept later in that talk. But as you could see, it's nothing more than placement of a nasogastric tube, uh, inflation of the balloon, and then uh, confirming the position endoscopically. So there's nothing special about balloons. It doesn't mean that the balloons are a completely safe intervention. It means that the procedure is technically simple. However, the therapy requires close monitoring for the patient to prevent complications. Now, here's the adjustable intragastric balloon. It's placed in a similar fashion, but the advantage here is uh, in order to uh, enhance tolerance for pa patients who uh, are not tolerant for the initial volume, you could pull a tube that allow you to adjust volume and you could withdraw some volume, which has been successful in clinical trials in allowing the majority of patients to continue with therapy rather than removing the balloon early. 
And once you hit a weight loss plateau, you could use the same mechanism in order to up titrate the volume to enhance uh, the weight loss uh, as well. And finally, this is the swallowed balloon. As you could see, it comes in a capsule. Once the capsule is confirmed to be in uh, an intragastric uh, position, it's filled with, uh, with, uh, with a, a fluid mixture. And uh, at, six, at four months uh, period, the valve uh, breaks down and the balloon uh, excrete, excrete its contents and exits with, 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 the, uh, with the bowel movement out of the patient's uh, body. So it's important to highlight the mechanism of action of intragastric balloon. We've learned a lot about how intragastric balloon work and that mechanism of actions have true implication to uh, both the weight loss that you observe with the intragastric balloon. It has implication for tolerance of intragastric balloon and the need for early retrieval. And also it could have metabolic implications as far as management of uh, of metabolic disease, especially non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So let's start with the picture because usually the, the a descriptive uh, picture is more valuable than looking at numbers. What you could see here, you could see balloon in, in its standard position, which is mid to distal body, not jammed in the antrum. And what you could see at the time of retrieval that there is significant food still above the balloon. So just looking at these pictures, whether with CT scan or with endoscopy, you realize that part of the mechanism of action of intragastric balloon or a large part of the mechanism of action is this delay in gastric emptying that happens as the result of placement of the balloon. Now, looking more objectively on results from randomized trial, this is a study from uh, a sub study from the US randomized trial of the Orbera intragastric balloon. You could see in blue is the gastric retention at two hours uh, in the Orbera group versus the lifestyle control in red. You could see at baseline, the retention at two hours was similar. At time of balloon indwelling, you could see a significant delay in gastric emptying to be almost three folds of that of control. And you could see that once we remove the balloon, this uh, delay in gastric emptying reverts back to normal, which goes with the, uh, with the uh, premise that the balloon is both uh, anatomy preserving and preserve the function of that organ. But while the balloon is in there, there is a significant delay in gastric emptying that is really persistent, does not uh, have this phenomenon of tachyphylaxis or getting uh, better uh, with time after the balloon. So with, I, I said it's important to understand the, this mechanism of action because it has significant implications to balloon tolerance and early retrieval. And in this study, we took about 100 patients and we administered gastric emptying at baseline. And you could see that here's percent retention uh, at baseline. And you could, and you could see that the, 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 the cohort who are contemplating balloon uh, therapy falls on a Bell's curve. So if you take somebody who is a rapid normal emptying at baseline, that means at baseline at two hours, there's only 10% retention of their ingested meal. Now you give them the balloon, you are delaying the gastric emptying to go, go from the green zone to the orange zone. So they're feeling fullness, and, but they're not necessarily not tolerating the balloon. So th these people uh, have, have uh, some efficacy with the intragastric balloon. And these are the people who tell you that we really, I mean, yeah, we feel the balloon is there, but it's not excessive uh, feeling and therefore they lose some weight, but not excessive weight. Then there's a cohort that they start in the middle of this range and you took them now from the, from the yellow and put them in the orange. And these are people who tells you, yeah, we feel the balloon. It's definitely uh, helping us uh, with, 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 with uh, prolonged satiety and satiation. Uh, and these are the people who will go, go through two, three days of accommodative symptoms after the two to three days, then they're feeling fine and they could go with a successful uh, intervention over six months to a year after balloon insertion they lose significant weight with, with balloon tolerance. But then there's a quartile of patients who starts this endeavor with a delayed gastric empty. That means they started in the orange red zone and now you give them the balloon and they just go into gastric eternity. The stomach stops working. And this is the people that you will see with this phenomena where the balloon is really wedged in the distal stomach, the, anter the, the proximal stomach and the fundus is dilated. And these are the people who will tell you that we need the balloon out. They go through a few days of 
misery of with nausea and vomiting, and then they end up not tolerating the balloon. And that's agnostic to the technology. Any fluid filled balloon, uh, whether endoscopic or non endoscopic, will go through the same phenomenon. Therefore, understanding the, how the mechanism of action of the intragastric balloon and, and selecting patients could provide a lot of advantages in, 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 uh, in, uh, in administering the right therapy for the right patient. Now, a word about fluid versus gas-filled balloon. This is a meta-analysis that we published in clinical gastrohepatology that showed you the concept that I just discussed. Delaying gastric emptying is a major mechanism of action of the intragastric balloon. It only happens with the fluid-filled intragastric balloon. It does not happen with air-filled intragastric balloon, as you could see. Therefore, fluid-filled intragastric balloon are more effective than air-filled intragast or gas-filled intragastric balloon, but they're less tolerated than the gas-filled intragastric balloon because of the mechanism of the different gradation of the delay in gastric emptying that I just showed you in the earlier slides. And that's why the concept of balloon adjustability works. This is a randomized trial that uh, myself and Dr. Thompson led, uh, and it was published in The Lancet in 2021, which we looked at the adjustable intragastric balloon in a large cohort of patients. And this to demonstrate that this mechanism of action of delayed gastric emptying has significant physiological implication to tolerance and efficacy of the intervention. And you could see that the downward adjustability function of the balloon uh, decreased the rate of intolerance to about 2.6 from the traditional 16% that we observed with non-adjustable intragastric balloon. Uh, therefore, it, uh, it offers uh, advantages to patients as far as tolerance and potentially also as far as increasing the weight loss after the patient reaches a plateau. So now going back uh, from the different technology to talking uh, about balloons as a class of devices or space occupying devices as, in, as far as endoscopic, bariatric and metabolic therapies and looking at efficacy and impact on comorbidities. Here I plot the different US randomized trials. Some of them were open label, some of them were against placebo, but you could see there's the interventional arms of the different trials. And then on the other end, you could see the lifestyle or placebo arms. As a group, the intragastric balloon will, will enable the average patient to reach this 10% uh, total body weight loss threshold at six months, which is not reached by any of the lifestyle or placebo controlled arm. The 10% is important because as we could, as I will show you, 10% is a threshold that's associated with improvement with the majority of obesity related comorbidities and it's also uh, associated with significant resol resolution or improvement of uh, steatohepatitis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Therefore, getting the average patient to realize 10% total body weight loss is an important clinical endpoint. And notice I say reaching that endpoint, I did not say maintaining that endpoint because maintaining that endpoint is a different question in hand. Here we're talking about weight loss, not weight maintenance. So again, uh, the, uh, this is a meta-analysis that uh, published by Dr. Popov uh, that looked at the impact of uh, the intragastric balloon in, in, in 10 randomized trial and more than 30 observational study. You could see that this 10% total body weight loss translates to improvement in fasting glucose, triglyceride, uh, blood pressure, uh, increased odds of diabetes remission and fatty liver disease as well. And uh, if you look about the safety of the intragastric balloon within the confound of multiple large randomized trial, post-FDA approval studies, meta-analysis, and Brazilian consensus that include more than 40,000 patients, you could see that when this intervention is administered in a high quality multidisciplinary fashion where patients are followed, it would be a, a very safe intervention. The problems happens is if uh, the patient I show you with the balloon wedge in the antrum, uh, they were sent home and nobody followed up with them and now they're vomiting and they come up with the perforation. This is not a function of, of the technology per se, that's a function of the lack of follow-up to manage a compl potential complication and prevent them. Uh, and as you could see, when you look at these randomized trials, uh, the rate of serious adverse events and death, uh, and death is, 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 very, is very low to negligible. Now we go back to this concept of, of the use of the intragastric balloon for management of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. That's a big deal area. 
because we know that there is no approved therapeutic for uh, NAPL D or steatohepatitis. We know that it afflicts the majority of patients with obesity and metabolic disease. And we know that it's gonna be the number one reason for liver transplantation uh, because how ubiquitous is this disease. But also we know that 10% total body weight loss is sufficient to resolve fat from the liver and resolve inflammation. However, the vast majority of interventions that we currently have are not sufficient to get patients to reach this 10% total, total body weight loss. With the, with the intragastric balloon, we could get this threshold, but also given the delay in gastric emptying uh, that happens after placement of the intragastric balloon, there's changes in post, uh, post meal glycemic control. That means the peaks of uh, high glucose and the peak insulin that happens is, is kind of tapered down and, and plateaued because of the delay in gastric emptying. And th that's why there's weight loss independent effect of the intragastric balloon on glucose metabolic metabolism and insulin peaks that drives less uh, free fatty acid into a top tissue like the liver and could have significant advantage uh, in the use of this technology for the management of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is a proof of concept study that we've done under an IDE with the FDA, where we took 21 patients with biopsy proven non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis. We did MR elastography at baseline. We did liver biopsy with EUS at baseline. And at six months, we repeated the MR elastography and we repeated a paired EUS guided liver biopsy as well in order to look at these uh, histological hard endpoints uh, with, uh, with intragastric balloon for, for steatohepatitis improvement. You could see, as I told you before, 90% improved their NAFLD or NAFLD activity score by, uh, in this cohort. 80% had more than two points improvement. 50% had MRE detected fibrosis improvement by 1.5 percent stage and 50 percent reach the hard endpoint that the FDA defines for any therapies for NASH, which is NASH resolution without progression of fibrosis. Therefore, I think you're going to see a lot more about the use of the intragastric balloon for the management of NAFLD and NASH in the near future. So now going back and putting this all together, uh, we talked about, uh, uh, about the balloon as a safe and effective weight loss device, and that's where we should position the balloon. And we, once the balloon is retrieved, we now need to focus on weight maintenance strategy. And these are two separate issues. There's the weight loss and then there's the weight maintenance. And if you look at the AGA recommendation of how we manage obesity, it breaks down any therapies into these concepts. You could see that we start with a, an intense weight loss in, uh, intervention. And the gastric balloon is, it could be a significant player in, in this phase of managing the patient because patients want to get engaged. That means they want to lose the weight, so they're feeling better, they're looking better, their comorbidities under, under remission, their joints do not hurt as much. And now they're engaged into this weight loss maintenance phase. So it's a phase. So you go from weight loss, uh, from weight loss to weight maintenance. And with weight maintenance, now you have an engaged patient who have lost significant weight, they're feeling better, now they're engaged in your behavioral program, they're engaged with your psychologist, they're engaged with nutrition, and you could add medications in that phase in order to help maintain that weight loss. So I think that's the key when we position the balloon is to position it at phases. And as you could see, this is the, uh, this is a spotlight on the intragastric balloon and the AGA now recommends the use of the intragastric balloon for the management of obesity and obesity related comorbidities such as NAFL D when it's given as part of this strategy of a weight loss program followed by a weight maintenance program after the intervention. And that's where, where it's important to highlight this again Patients come with you hitting this wall multiple times. You want some intervention to break, to break the wall of significant weight loss that is tangible. That means makes them look better and feel better. And the intragastric balloon, such as, similar to bariatric surgery and other intervention, does a good job in inducing this weight loss. And once you get this weight loss and you remove the balloon, it's important to shift the strategy now on a weight maintenance strategy where lifestyle and behavioral intervention is a key component followed for, by pharmacotherapies, followed by longer indwelling time of the balloon or sequential balloon therapies. And finally, those who do not make it, uh, graduate them to bariatric surgery. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention and I will end my presentation and happy to entertain any questions that comes up.